The world is divided into four spheres, each sphere divided among continents and nations. Nations are divided by borders and interests. These interests divide the news. We examine the impact of these divisions on people and power. This is Imaginary Lines. Welcome to the program. I'm your host, Chris Spanos. Coming up on the show, a recently published book argues that communications technology has transformed social movements into a new cyber left. The book's title is Digital Rebellion. I'll speak with its author, Todd Wolfson, about the book. But first, a look at news as reported by major media. Who hacked Sony? No one really knows, but that doesn't stop a chorus of media speculation that it was North Korea. According to the corporate media narrative, North Korea hacked Sony in retaliation for their movie The Interview about assassinating North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. The New York Times David Sanger and Nicole Perloff gave senior administration officials a free pass to make the malicious accusations. They accused North Korea of being centrally involved in the hack and categorized it as a cyber terrorist attack. As The Intercept's Glenn Greenwald observed, the Washington Post also granted anonymity to officials to claim with 99% certainty that hackers working for the North Korean government carried out the attack. Both The Times and Washington Post dedicated most of their articles to exploring the retaliatory actions that the U.S. government could take against the North Koreans. As Greenwald explains, that kind of reflexive embrace of government claims is journalistically inexcusable for all cases, for reasons that should be self-evident. But in this case, it's truly dangerous, he said. The hysterical U.S. media might learn something from Chairman Mao's famous dictum, no investigation, no right to speak. From the Zapatistas and independent media centers of the 1990s to the Arab Spring and Occupy Wall Street of the 21st century, Todd Wolfson's new book, Digital Rebellion, The Birth of the Cyber Left, examines how new media and communications technology impacts social movements. Todd Wolfson is professor at Rutgers University and co-founder of the Media Mobilizing Project. He joins me to discuss his new book. Hi, Todd. Welcome to Imaginary Lines. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. First, let's look at the title of your book. What do you mean by digital rebellion and your phrase, the cyber left? Yeah, uh, uh, so the cyber left is a term I, I coin with the, the goal of trying to pull together all the fragments or different elements that we see in contemporary social movements, whether it's uh, consensus democratic decision making or a real focus on the use of media and communications in social movement organizing. Cyber left is a term I use to kind of capture all of these different elements and look at them with a comparative function in relationship, and this is primarily in the U.S., in relationship to what we could call the old left and the new left, the old left having been kind of the main left-based social movement organizing focus from the early part of the 20th century to World War II, and the new left being the movements we know in the 1960s. Talk about how your own experience with indie media and organizing in Philadelphia informed the ideas in your book. From the beginning, I, my goal was to be a participant and to learn from doing. Um, and so I did that, and I spent two to three years within the indie media movement, first in the Philadelphia Independent Media Center, and then I kind of followed the national and global trajectories of this national network, global network, and became parts of global editorial teams and global um, decision-making processes. Like many of us who participated in the anti-corporate globalization movement of the 90s, the Zapatistas provided a lot of inspiration. How did the Zapatistas contribute to the emergence of the cyber left that you describe? I really think that there, I mean, there are probably many origin points that we could mark, but I would say that the Zapatistas is the focal origin point. Um, and, and I'm sure your, your viewers know, but the Zapatistas rose up on the first January 1st of 1994, the day the North American Free Trade Agreement 
went into effect, which tried to liberalize trade amongst the three North American nations. Um, and the Zapatistas rose up because they said that this the free trade agreement and other decisions prior to it were a death knell to their way of life and would actually kill them. So they rose up in order to be heard. But they rose up at a very interesting moment, at the same moment that the Internet had sort of begun to have a public presence. I mean, it had been germinating for a long time, but it was going public. And so in their struggle with the Mexican state, uh, they successfully deployed, and those who supported them successfully deployed Internet networks in order to force a peace accord with the Mexican government. This, I think, is arguably the first moment when uh, cybernetic technologies were were deployed and used in struggle in this way. And if you look back at the 60s or even at the old left, um, the way they thought about media within a movement was that you had an already configured movement and then you had a media arm. And the media arm was an appendage that spit out the message of an already configured social movement or class of people struggling for social change. What the Zapatistas and indie media have re uh, they reimagined what the role of media is. And I would say a better, more apt metaphor for them is more like a nervous system, that it actually builds, connects, and configures the movement as it's, it's going. So the communications and media becomes a critical infrastructure that develops and builds the movement itself. And you see this in the Arab Spring with the way Twitter was deployed and even the way Facebook book was deployed. And you also see it in things like Occupy and more recently in Ferguson, where things like the hashtag Black Lives Matter is meant to knit together and hold together all these points of resistance to U.S.-based racism and police and state uh, violence. What do you think these ideas mean for the strategic possibilities and direction of social movements? What we need to see are movements that both, that both you know, have a sort of visionary call to democracy, have a belief in the role of media in telling our stories and knitting us together in a way that enables sort of a kind of social explosion like we saw in Occupy, um, that really valorize the role of young people and their needs of young people. I, I think we want to hold those things, but I think we want to, and this comes from, you know, a, a vision of the kind of digital empires we're struggling against, but we also need to see those same movements fight to build organization. And so the reason why Ferguson is so exciting is because it's not only a hashtag Black Lives Matter and people doing really exciting forms of resistance with die-ins happening across the country, but there's also the development of new organization to build and support these struggles in the long term. Thank you, Todd, for joining me on Imaginary Lines. Thank you so much. It's been great to have a chance to speak with you, Chris. And now we'll look at Latin America. Mexican authorities may have disappeared photojournalist and social activist Moises Sanchez Cerezo, who has been missing since January 2nd. The Attorney General's Office of the Mexican State of Veracruz announced that several municipal police of the community Medellin de Bravo have been detained in connection to the forced disappearance of Moisa Sanchez. According to witnesses and neighbors, three vehicles arrived at the home of Sanchez January 2nd at 7.30 p.m., when a group of nine heavily armed men forcibly kidnapped the journalist, taking his computers, cameras, and cell phones. Moisa Sanchez is director, reporter, and photographer for the weekly local magazine, The Union. He also participated in a community neighborhood watch group and denounced local corruption. Journalist rights groups have rung alarms in Veracruz about the current administration of Governor Javier Duarte de Ochoa. Since his administration began in 2010, a total of 10 journalists have been killed and five are considered still missing. The case of Cerezo follows on allegations that Mexican authorities were also involved in the abduction of 43 students from the state of Guerrero. The case of the students has mobilized massive opposition to the Mexican government over the past three months. That's it for today's Imaginary Lines. Thanks for watching the show. I'm your host, Chris Spanos. Please join me next week.